Um, over the last few decades, some of the strongest voices of climate denial and fossil fuel use have also been those on the far right. Um, so a big question is how have these forces come together? Um, and uh, more importantly for a left committed to anti-fascism and climate action, how do we fight back against this? Um, to start the discussion, we're delighted to be joined by Andreas Malm and George Edwards from the Zetkin Collective. Uh, this collective is a group of scholars, activists and students working on the political ecology of the far right since 2018 and their upcoming book, White Skin, Black Fuel, on the dangers of fossil fascism is out in May of this year from Verso Books. Um, so uh, I will pass to George for the first bit of speaking. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic, thanks very much, uh, Una. I'm just gonna share my screen. Let's see if that works. Does this, yeah, okay. Okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, Andreas and I are two parts of the Zetkin Collective. Uh, we're a 20 strong group of scholars, activists, and students. Um, and our collective research effort has culminated into the book, White Skin, Black Fuel on the Danger of Fossil Fascism. In it, we focus in on race, racism, the far right, and fascism in the past and the present, seeking to address the relation to ecology, climate, fossil fuels, and their technologies. So I'm going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes giving a brief introduction to the book, discussing how the contemporary far right, mostly in Europe, relate to fossil fuels and, cli uh, and climate in rather broad terms. I will then give these concepts a bit more texture in the context of the UK. And then to finish, I will speak briefly on fossil fascism and highlight the distinction between fascism as a set of ideas and as a historical force. Um, I hope I'll be able to squeeze this in and we can build on any specifics afterwards. Okay, right. Uh, oh, shoot. Okay. Um, yeah, so as the science of climate change matured in the late 80s, so came the efforts to downplay the severity of its findings. A bunch of think tanks funded by those whose interests were threatened employed professional denialists, testified in Congress, flooded the media with adverts, and produced an endless flow of other materials spreading their beliefs amongst a flurry of other activities quite well known now, but all efforts to deny the reality of a climate crisis that threatened business as usual. Scholars of this entity have labelled it the denial machine, but we in the book identify it as the denialist ideological state apparatus in the Althusserian sense that it is used to secure one element of the dominant ideology against the peril of climate science. Over the next decades, this uh, denialist apparatus uh, evolved adapting to external pressures, obscuring its funding channels, while some of its agents shifted to other strategies such as greenwashing. The overarching purpose remained to delay any showdown with fossil capital. So the phenomenon of denial was recognized as a chiefly Amer Anglo-American. Influential, no doubt, but simply not taken seriously in large parts of Europe. Uh, and as the climate science continues to mount and consensus crystallized, capitalist climate governance seemed like the only game left in town. Commentators and scholars of denial had all but written its obituary. Um, then in the second decade of the 21st century, climate denial was given a new life when it was integrated into the ideological state apparatus of far right parties and presidents. The same tropes were recycled that uh, Earth's climate is always changing, that carbon dioxide is good for you, that climate alarmism is a leftist hoax. But the logic of far-right denial deviated from the original. Whereas the original effort declared that the free market is precious, all is well, climate change is not a real problem. The far-right said the nation is precious, it is going under, climate change is a non-problem. For the central interpolation of the far-right was nationalist, and for far-right parties in Europe particularly, this meant one thing above all else. That was his hostility to immigration. And it was on the back of this hostility that denial, for the first time, made inroads deep into European politics, from Germany to Sweden, Netherlands to Austria, states long considered the world's beacons of climate mitigation. Despite having no profits to protect, the far right objectively worked as the defensive shield for interests rooted in fossil fuels. 
this mutation of the denialist ideological state apparatus proved itself more politically potent than its predecessor. Why was this the case? So a central thesis in the book is that the same values invested in the nation are similarly found in the fossil economy. So the defense of one was simultaneously the defense of the other. For countries that had their own fossil fuels, nationalist Im imaginaries were easily invested in the fossilized stock itself, the lignite of Germany and Poland, the peat of Finland and Norwegian oil, a position that segues to maximize production. Yet in countries with no fossil fuels, it was the material privileges of the fossil economy more broadly, cars and such that were seen to be threatened by an emission of climate change. Um, sorry, George, could I just, uh, uh, we're getting some messages about you right. being a bit far from the microphone. Um, right, okay. I wonder if there's a way it could be a bit better. Yeah, sure. It's, I don't know. I'm much better, like, yeah. That's, that's much better? That's pretty good. Thank okay. you. Okay, cool. Um, I'll hold it here. Um, okay, so... Yeah, the argument we hear, we make here is a historical one, which I'm going to skim over and I think Andreas will elaborate on later. Um, but for the far right in the 2010s, denial remained the dominant position. No other party family was so indifferent to questions of climate and environment. Uh, denial was not the only one, uh, sorry. What's going on here? Uh, so denial was not the only way those on the far right related to the environment. However, some parties did not deny the ecological crisis, at least on a discursive plane, but took it on board as a reason to fortify borders and keep immigrants out. In the book, we label this subsidiary position as green nationalism. Here, the defense of the white nation is synonymous with the protection of nature. So the French far right in the shape of Le Pen's Rassemblement National may be the paradigmatic green nationalists, their attitudes synthesized by one of their ideologues as the best ally for ecology is the border. So there are two ideological strands that inform green nationalism. The first is Malthusianism, sorry, Malthusianism, pinning ecological ills on population growth elsewhere typically. And the second is some mythical attachment to national nature, invoking blood and soil thinking. So the fear of overpopulation and love for the land merged easily together, uniting some central myths of the far right. The horrors of Christchurch and El Paso showed what happens when such green nationalist thinking is taken to its extreme. So denial and green nationalism, these were the two main ways in which the far right related to the environment and fossil fuels in the 2010s. But on closer inspection, there wasn't much to separate them. Green nationalists, much like denialists, did not inspire mobilization against the actual causes of climate breakdown. From Finland to France, no green nationalists attempted to rid their economies of fossil fuels. So in the book, we regard green nationalism as an offspring of denial, another modality of the anti-climate politics of the far right, always overshadowed by the one motive of stopping and reversing immigration. Uh, of course, like these categorizations um, we offer in the book are not absolute or, or fixed, and uh, green nationalism could potentially mutate into a force to target fossil fuels and shut down actual emissions. Uh, Austria, Austria and Denmark have shown signs of moving in this direction. Um, but yeah, the political ecology of the far right is a dynamic interface. And um, yeah, I think we'll turn and look at Britain for that. So in the annals of denial, the UK like, occupies a special place, albeit subordinate to the US as a loudspeaker of climate denial. A network of think tanks operated as the UK wing of the denialist uh, ideological state apparatus. Though particular to this apparatus was an emphasis on Britain leaving the EU. So the Brexit project, um, the, Bre the Brexit project exemplified a core dynamic we explore in this book, the simultaneous foregrounding of immigration in general and Muslims in particular, whilst downplay downplaying the climate. This, um, the obsession with immigrants was at center stage during the referendum itself, uh, whilst two of its figureheads, Johnson and Farage, were united in their public denial of climate science. Yet post-Brexit, once the boundary between the centre and the far right was fully dissolved and the Tories now the fully inclusive denomination of the right, Johnson ditched denial and embraced offshore wind. 
The same wind that a few years ago couldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding was now the centerpiece of the green industrial revolution. It's uh, apparent abundance comparable to Saudi Arabia's oil. So unlike in France, where agrarian lifestyles were seen to be threatened by free trade, uh, the Tories' vision of a green Britain is laden with technological optimism, free markets and exceptionalism. Yet the hypocrisy is total. Not only are the sources, the actual sources of emissions being left untouched, they're being added to. So we continue to see the squabbling over a new mine, coal mine in Cumbria and the ban on Heathrow Airport expansion overturn. Then came the £16 billion investment for further drilling in the North Sea. Whilst nearly all investment made at last year's Africa-UK trade summit went to fossil fuel extraction and infrastructure on that continent, much in the same way the aid budget has been spent over the last decade or so. And for all the talk of a post-COVID green recovery, the UK, only, be, only to be outdone by Trump's America, pumped more billions into fossil fuel industries, dwarfing any investment uh, into renewables. And in last month's budget, the aviation industry was helped by cutting air passenger duty of domestic flights and left fuel duty unchanged. And then there's Nigel, who has also given up on denial and painted himself green, now backing a tree planting carbon offset scheme that will enclose lands in sub-Saharan Africa, dispossess those living there, capture new forms of monopoly rent and ultimately allow business as usual to motor on. Whilst now a political pariah, Farage's ideas do not exist in a vacuum. Uh, this brand of environmentalism supported by him and his ilk also recognise the harmony between a national na nature and national identity and protect and the call to protect these green spaces from foreign species is never far away. Central here is the idea that the left has an illegitimate monopoly on environmentalism, which the right must break up. The Daily Express are now on a green crusade um, and they describe Farage as the man to grow our dream. Whilst one of the Tufton Street think tanks declared how our green and pleasant land requires strong borders. I think we should expect to hear more of this sort of environmentalism echoed throughout parts of the media in the coming while. So what to make of the British case, General? So whilst acknowledging that there is indeed a crisis, these solutions ensure the global climate regime remains market-centered, capital-friendly, and leaves the material privileges of those belonging to the British nation untouched. Whilst the actual sources of climate breakdown are completely missed, an imperial program of accumulation repackaged and sold around the idea of national limits is uh, ushered in. Indeed, the net zero ambitions of the British state and companies like Shell and BP depend on precisely the sort of nature-based solutions endorsed by Farage and co. Both the ideological and repressive state apparatus are becoming increasingly authoritarian, stepping up anti-immigrant rhetoric, agitating in the culture war and engaging in open racism against travellers. Then there's the police bill and brutality, the immigration policy and defence budget revamp. Together, preemptively striking at dissenters, securitizing borders, and consolidating geo geopolitical dynamics, whilst nurturing the sort of national subjectivities that could justify lifeboat ethics. So we must conclude that a pro-business green nationalism as a response for a global ecological crisis is wholly ineffectual, irrational, and racist. It is consistent with the anti-climate politics of the broader far right and should perhaps be judged as the most deceitful and dangerous mutation of denial. So just to round up the danger of, uh, uh, as the title of our book suggests, um, our study is alert to the danger of fossil fascism. Um, so I just want to spend the last few minutes just discussing the distinction between fascism as a set of ideas and uh, as a hi real historical force. So our definition of fascism is built from Roger Griffin, who identifies its mythical core as palingenetic ultranationalism. That is ultranationalism built around the sequence of past, past grandeur, present crisis, coming rebirth of the exclusive nation. 
for the contemporary far right are circulating around this core for a whole bunch of other ideas and conspiracy theories. That the cherished nation is under attack by invading others, that the climate change is a left-wing fabrication and that cultural Marxists are coordinating the great replacement, et cetera, et cetera. But we try to do justice uh, to fascism, not only as a set of ideas, but rather as a real force, one that results in systematic violence uh, to those deemed enemies of the nation. So the historical record uh, reveals two preconditions for fascism to emerge as force. First, that fascists came to power with the backing of the dominant class. And second, that it was from within a deep crisis with which the dominant class turned to the fascists. The ecological and specifically the climate crisis is clearly of a magnitude which may bring a politics that resembles fascism to coalesce. Despite now decades of science crystallized in its message, um, we continue to burn more and more fossil fuels and we're on course to reach a thousand parts of CO2 per million by the end of the century. So we are now in a situation where full breakdown can be averted only by a Herculean redirection and restructuring of the world economy. So the anti-climate politics of the far right uh, force us to entertain some scenarios along this path. So let's suppose a government of some advanced capitalist country came to power and did heed the science, instigating five to 10% emissions cuts year on year and insisting that no longer can fossil fuels be dug up from the ground and burnt. The sanctity of private ownership over the means of production would be broken. For a class presiding over fossil fuels, this would be an existential crisis. Whilst for the parts of the economy dependent on fossil fuels, this would be a deep structural crisis. Now what happens if at the same moment there is two a surging far right who do not believe the climate hype, continue to cry white woke hysteria and blame the crisis on immigrants instead, it is in such a crisis scenario that we may then expect members of this particular class to form an alliance with the far right. Or well, let's suppose that mitigation is continuously averted, but what is foreboded in the science can no longer be ignored. Trout, uh, droughts, floods, storms and fires all, in, all intensify, devastating stores and circuits of food and resources. National emergencies follow with peace, prosperity, domestic order and any residually functioning democracy now under threat. When serious shortages set in, when things like inhabitable land and edible food become scarce, stockpiling and safeguarding is likely to happen in a pattern which likely corresponds to centers of historic accumulation and thus emissions. Here too, property would be thrown into disarray and we, and we can anticipate, to quote Jeff Ely, fortress mentalities and gatedness as the emergent social paradigm. In both scenarios, dominant classes with their roots in fossil fuels will have interests to guard, whereby the politics of ultranationalism might come in handy. It might maintain the cohesion of the state to ensure continued accumulation, or it could be used to beat back the challenge of a mass movement that is calling for emissions cuts or for the distribution of res resources from those who have more to those who have less. These are, of course, hypothetical situations, but there are clearly fascist tendencies within the contemporary far right. And should a co coalition be built here, present, uh, present trends suggest a future where race will be a vector of diversion and deflection in defense of fossil fuels. Uh, this is the danger of fossil fascism. And this is where I will finish. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'll, I'll pass to Andreas now. Uh, yes, um, I, I first want to say that I'm extremely grateful to a comrade George for giving a, a very impressive summary of the core arguments of the book. Um, now, uh, I, I have to say that I see a couple of other members of the Zetkin Collective here in the audience, Lise and Anushka. Uh, and uh, uh, during the Q and A uh, and the discussion, let, let let's see what what all of the comments here are interested in in discussing. I won't talk for very long. Um, I'll I'll just say a couple of words on uh, the structure of this book and how it came about. So we started doing this research, uh, as was mentioned, back in the summer of or the late late spring of 2018. Uh, and uh, we had first thought that we should write a paper on uh, the energy and climate policies of the far right, because it was an understudied and overlooked topic. 
but then when we started forming our group and people started looking into various different countries whose languages they spoke, um, we discovered that there was so much happening that this uh, very quickly ballooned into something much bigger than an article. And then Bolsonaro came to power in Brazil and uh, things continued to deteriorate, it seemed, uh, on, on this front in 2019. And we ended up with this quite massive book. It's nearly 600 pages long. And it, it, it consists of two parts. So in the first part, we look at what the far right has done about energy and climate, said and done in primarily the past decade or so in 13 countries in Europe, plus the US and Brazil. So uh, I, I, I'm grateful that, that George didn't mention uh, the name Donald Trump, but uh, he is there. Uh, 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 and he, uh, in a sense, plays a significant role in the book because in a way, now that he's gone, this is, uh, uh, well, partly an attempt to take stock of him and what he represented uh, and uh, try to put, put the uh, frightful experience of race and climate in the past four years in the US in a transnational setting. Obviously, there are major gaps in this book. We're not looking into the situation in countries like Canada, Australia, Russia, uh, uh, or India. Uh, uh, but there's already enough material there, I think. And it would have been completely unwieldy if we would have added more. But this is an ongoing research project. And uh, we organized uh, a conference with uh, scholars and uh, activists uh, back in late 2019 and expect this work to continue with uh, all sorts of, uh, of research and activist groups around the world uh, because the far right is not going away. It will be a part of the transition if a transition ever happens. Uh, it will be a major obstacle to it that will have to be overcome. Um, and if there is no transition, if the climate, climate crisis just uh, deepens without any attempt to uh, rid our economies of fossil fuels for real, then surely the far right will also play a role in the ensuing uh, collapses and crisis. Now, the second part of the book is, is an attempt to go deeper into the history and try to uh, grapple with the question, where does this come from? Uh, what are the historical roots of this far-right anti-climate politics? And we uh, present a number of more or less speculative interpretations and hypotheses um, uh, around quite a few different factors that are at play here, um, including uh, far-right traditional conspiracy theories, but also uh, the... Um, articulation of race and energy in the original British empire and more specifically in the 19th century. And I'll, I'll just say a few words about that. Uh, so uh, the 19th century obviously was the period when for the first time, large scale fossil fuel combustion spread around the world out from the British Isles. And uh, uh, key to this diffusion was the steamboat um, and also, of course, the, 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 the railway, the, the locomotives. Uh, and these vehicles were powered by the original fossil fuel coal. And uh, over the 19th century, this whole techn technological complex focused around steam power became um, absolutely fundamental to modern racism. Up to that point, uh, and here we draw on the work of Michael Adas and others, Race, European racism had largely been informed by religion. So slavery, for instance, had been justified with versions of the, uh, of the idea of um, uh, the curse of Ham, this, this story in, the, uh, in, the, in, in Genesis, in the Old Testament, where uh, Noah's son Ham happens upon him naked, and for this crime he receives a curse. And the idea was, it was already in play in the, in, in the Middle Ages, but we, we don't need to go into the historical details there. But the idea being then that black people are the descendants of Ham, and because of this curse, it's right to enslave them. But in the 19th century, this sort of, of, of religious racism gave way to uh, uh, what we call techno-racism, where the idea was that white people are superior to peoples of color, 
as we uh, now refer to such people, uh, because white people have better technologies and have full mastery of nature. And uh, the, the core of this technological superiority was seen as the steam engine. Uh, and uh, uh, it was practiced in, 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 in uh, uh, British colonialism as the advance of steamboats and railroads in various peripheries around the world. And I'll, I'll just offer uh, one quotation to back up this narrative. This is from um, uh, John Turnbull Thompson, who was a, uh, a superintendent um, of various imperial um, uh, branches in Asia, and he became the surveyor general of uh, New Zealand in 1856. And he gave a lecture two decades later, so in, in the mid 1870s, where he kind of looked back at the development, uh, the developments happening in the British Empire over the 19th century. And he posed this question, I quote, what has made the white man or more conspicuously the Anglo-Saxon of the Teutonic race so ubiquitously progressive and, and aggressive? This more especially of so recent a date. It is his humanity and science combined with steam. And what makes steam for him? It is coal. What then has coal to do with our race? As far as we know yet, everything. So here the idea was very explicit that the foundation of the power of the white race was steam and steam power and uh, in the next step, uh, thereby coal. And we provide uh, quite a few other examples of this, this, this uh, uh, racist ideology and how it spread in Britain and uh, uh, the US in the 19th century. And then we try to follow this into the 20th century by looking at automobility and the, 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 the machine of the car and its role in, uh, uh, to begin with, American racism and more particularly the role of the car as a vehicle for spatial segregation uh, where uh, automobility in the uh, uh, post-war era became uh, very closely tied to uh, what's sometimes referred to as white flight. So white, white people fleeing the, uh, uh, the, the black inner city uh, ghettos uh, by means of the car. And we tried to uh, follow this all the way into uh, contemporary, very aggressive defense of the car and of uh, of uh, uh, of petrol, of diesel, of of gas line by the far right, uh, not the least in Europe. Um, okay, uh, yeah, we draw on on various other uh, historical sources of this complex, including, of course, uh, uh, Nazi ecology. Although we emphasize. Uh, another strand of classical fascism, namely its extremely fetishistic relation to uh, fossil fuel technologies, such as uh, the car, the airplane, and coal, and generally combustion and burning things. Uh, this we, we study in the, in the proto-fascist writings of Marinette and Jünger, and then in the actual policies of the Mussolini and Hitler regimes. Uh, and we draw towards the end on a little bit of uh, Frankfurt School theory to try to, to grasp with some of the, uh, the psychological dimensions of this, the, these various forms of, uh, of denial. Um, uh, finally, towards the end, we have a, a postscript on the developments of last year during the pandemic. So we finished this book. Uh, we actually submitted it just before the pandemic broke out and then everything sort of changed. Uh, and not the least importantly, Trump lost the election. And uh, last year was a relatively bad year for the far right compared to the uh, enormously successful preceding years with, with a fairly devastating loss uh, of, of the White House and with some setbacks for certain far right parties in Europe, although the situation is very uneven and uh, none of these far right parties can really be uh, discounted uh, and written off. Uh, but yeah, towards the end, we try to, to point towards some, some, uh, some of the more recent trends and what they might imply, imply for the near future. Uh, I think I'll leave it there and we'll, uh, we'll see what comrades want to discuss. And uh, I hope uh, uh, Lise and Anushka won't be uh, too upset with me uh, or with George if, if some of us uh, uh, redirect questions to them as well.